once again, welcome to uh, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. If you're here in person or if you're watching via the live stream, we want to welcome you once again. And, and thank you for, for taking the time this morning to come here and to worship with us and to uh, just spend some time together in fellowship uh, with the body. Before I get into the announcements, though, I do want to just address one, um, one issue, and that's, of course, the, the mask mandate that the county of El Paso has, has mandated for the entire county. And um, for, according to the mandate, uh, everyone, all citizens are supposed to wear uh, masks while indoors. Um, however, yesterday, Pastor Angel and I, we, we looked at the, the mandate itself. And if you look there, I think it's in one of the sections, I think it's like section four there, it does mention that um, places of, of worship, such as Fresh Vision, Calvary Chapel, or church here, um, are exempt from the mandate. So therefore, as we have been doing, uh, face masks will be optional. We do have some in the back if you do desire to, to wear one. And um, if you choose to wear one, if you don't choose to wear one, we will support your decision here at uh, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. And praise the Lord that face masks are not an essential to salvation, right? Because there'd be a lot of issues right now, um, and we don't want this to be a place of division. So whatever you choose for yourself and for your family, uh, we will support that here um, at the church. Amen? And if you're watching via the live stream or even here in person, and you want to learn more about the church, I do want to encourage you to visit our website at fvccelp.com. And we'll just pull it up here so you, you all can, can see this. Um, so if you go to our website, once again, there's a lot of information about the church. You're interested in maybe a statement of faith, what we believe here. You want to learn more about Pastor Angel and his family. You can visit the website and you can get that information. Uh, if you go to the site menu tab there, it'll have, um, I like to call a table of contents for the entire website. And if you want to learn more about those specific things I just mentioned, you can click on those. Um, and as always, I, I do encourage you all to check out our media link. There we have all of the, the past and the current studies on our different uh, platforms. So uh, SoundTunes, I'm sorry, yeah, SoundCloud, not SoundTunes. SoundCloud, iTunes podcast, and, and YouTube. Ah, they're all the same, right? Um, so if you want to subscribe to those, you, you can uh, see our latest studies. And I do want to encourage you to spread the gospel by sharing those messages on your own uh, personal uh, social media platform. And um, I think if you scroll a little bit further down, actually, if you go to the, I think it's in the contact us. Yeah, if you want to contact us during the week, and here there's also some links to our social media, um, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram, and then, of course, our YouTube uh, channel. And uh, if you do want to get in contact during the week, that link will take you here, and you can fill that out, and we'll get back to you um, as soon as possible. And then a little bit further down, if you scroll there, there we have the physical uh, meeting address for the church, our church um, email address, as well as the, um, the phone number, and then, of course, our service time, just in case you want to invite someone to church, or maybe you're desiring to come and you don't know exactly where the church is, um, is located. Um, also, we don't have a formal offering here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. However, as the Lord leads you to give, uh, if you're here in person, we have the agape box in the back there. If you're watching via the live stream or even here, if you want to give electronically, you can uh, click on that uh, donate now or um, on the site menu there. It, it says um, donate now or online giving. And it'll take you to the bottom where the, um, the PayPal link is. Okay. And if you're watching via the live stream, there, there is a PayPal link down in the video description below. Okay. And, um, and also, if you want to leave a comment, any, anything there, prayer requests, anything like that, we will, we will get back to you as soon as possible as well. And um, as always, the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Uh, you don't want to give grudgingly or forcefully. And um, as we've mentioned, all of the gifts, all of the, um, the funds that come to Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel are used solely for the purposes of building God's kingdom and pointing people uh, to Jesus Christ. So once again, the, the, the website has a lot of information about the church. If you want to visit that a little bit later, uh, you can check that out. And um, once again, just let us know if you have any questions. And uh, just some general announcements. Uh, Wednesdays, the men are gathering here at the church at 6.30 in the evening. And um, we are currently going through the book of Genesis. And uh, we also have a time of fellowship. And we also share a, me share a meal together. So if you're interested, you can contact the church. Or you can just come by at 6.30 uh, here at the church on Wednesday evenings. We also have a youth group here, um, Unashamed Ministry, middle school, high school age. And we meet right after announcements. We are currently going through the Gospel of Luke. 
Um, in fact, today we're about halfway done, so that's kind of exciting, I think, milestone. Maybe for me, but I think for, for, the, for the young people as well, right? Oh, he just talks and talks and talks. No, no, so we're, we're getting there. We're going to get through the, the whole Gospel of Luke there, in the Lord's timing, of course. Um, but if you're interested, you, you want to connect with a youth group, uh, please check us out here at Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, and um, it'll, it'll be a blessed time of fellowship and also a blessed time in the Word. And we also have children's ministry. If that's maybe keeping you from coming to church, uh, don't let that keep you from coming to church. We have a place for your children. They will also meet after the announcements here in the back. And um, once again, for small children. And um, if you have any questions about any of those ministries, uh, just contact the church and uh, we can give you that information that you, um, you are desiring. And um, I think with that said, that's all of the announcements for the week. And um, I'll just go ahead and pass it to, to Pastor Angel now. Thank you for being here another week here at uh, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel, Northeast El Paso. If you have your Bibles with you, um, we'll be in 2 Samuel chapter 14. You can start turning there if you want. And I've titled today's message, A Difficult Homecoming. Now, if you were with us in last week as we covered chapter 13, or even if you weren't, or this is the first time you've joined us and you're just now watching let me just quickly, uh, briefly just share what we covered last year, because it's part of this entire story. In the previous chapter, we saw how love turned to lust, how lust turned to hate, how hate turned to murder. And then at the end, we saw how murder turned into exile. As we move on now, as we move on to chapter 14 today, um, we see that it's now set three years after the events of chapter 13. Now, <clears throat> something to keep in mind that, that even though Absalom had fled, even though he had run away and had lived in exile for murdering his half-brother, it's unknown at this time whether he'll ever return back to Jerusalem. No one knows. It's, it's, you know, he doesn't know, David doesn't know, the, you know, the city, the population doesn't know that their favorite crown prince was, if he was ever going to come back. But the thing is that a problem that had, like this, that had just occurred, that we read about in chapter 13, it doesn't just go away. It doesn't just disappear, even if you run away from it, even if you try to hide from it, even if you um, ignore it, you know, shove it under the rug. Um, no, it still remains, and it festers. And the longer it festers without any kind of resolution, the greater the damage will be. So today our text will now shift from exile to reconciliation and will be about how a fractured relationship between a father and son was resolved albeit some some awkwardness there it wasn't there was still some underlying issues that again weren't resolved but at least there was reconcil a type of reconciliation there and I'll explain more about this as I cover this chapter but here in 14, chapter 14, we'll be also seeing how Joab, David's military commander, played a key role in solving this family conflict by initiating re reconciliation between David and his son Absalom. We can see that it's clear that Joab's main goal of reconciliation was for David's sake. And see, there was two things that he had in mind. There was two things that he was, a couple of things that he was seeing. First of all, David. He knew David for a long time, and he knew this was bothering him. The fact that his son had, you know, he wanted to see his son, he wanted his son to come home. But also, he understood that this issue wasn't resolved, wasn't quickly resolved, it was going to cause greater problems in the long run. Not just for David and his family, but also for the entire nation of Israel. 
So he stepped in, took the initiative, and did what he could to, to fix it. Now, although this is an important lesson that we're going to cover towards the end of this chapter, we're all, towards the end of this chapter, we're also going to see and learn some other few lessons within this chapter that we can learn from as well. And as I said, I'll be covering, covering more of that towards the end of this message. So before we get into God's word, let's pray and ask him to speak to us this morning. Lord, we, we are thankful for what you have done in our lives, in the lives of our loved ones, in the lives of, of those that you know, were on their way to everlasting suffering, Lord. And we are thankful that you sent your son to die for us and for them and and that there's hope now, Lord. There is mercy, there is redemption, there has been reconciliation, Lord. And Lord, that again couldn't have happened without your beautiful grace, your wonderful grace. So now as we continue in this time of worship of sitting in your feet, sitting at your feet, to listen, to hear your word, I pray that you will speak, that we will take your word and and just um, hear it, meditate on it, concentrate on it, Lord, just uh, and not allow any distractions to get in the way. Lord, the problems of life, the issues of that we're dealing with outside of these walls, I pray that they will not be a stumbling block to anybody, and that right now they just will hear from you and what you have to say through your inerrant word. Lord, we believe that you have something beautiful in store for us, Lord, and so now we ask that you reveal that to us. Fill this room with your spirit. Lord, protect us, keep us safe from any harm, and uh, Lord, open our eyes and ears right now. Pray this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. First Samuel chapter 14. And the Word of God says, Joab, son of Zeruiah, realized that the king's mind was on Absalom. So Joab sent someone to Tekoa to bring a wise woman from there. He told her, pretend to be mourning, dressed in mourning clothes, and don't put any... Don't put on any oil. Act like a woman who's been mourning for the dead for a long time. Go to the king and speak these words to him. Then Joab told her exactly what to say. When the woman from Tekoa came to the king, she fell face down to the ground, paid homage, and said, Help me, your majesty. What's the matter? The king asked her. Sadly, I am a widow. My husband and my husband died, she said. Your servant had two sons. They were fighting in the field with, with no one to separate them, and one struck the other and killed him. Now the whole clan has risen up against your servant and said, Hand over the one who killed his brother so that we may put him to death for the life of the, of the brother he murdered. We will, we will eliminate the heir. They would extinguish my one remaining ember by not preserving my husband's name or posterity on earth. The king told the woman, go home. I will issue a command on your behalf. Then the woman of Tekoa said to the king, my lord, the king, may any blame be on me and my father's family and may the king and his throne be innocent. Whoever speaks to you, the king said, bring him to me. He will not trouble you again. She replied, please, may the king invoke the Lord your God so that the avenger of blood will not increase the loss and they will not eliminate my son. As the Lord lives, he vowed, not a hair of your, son's, uh, of your, not a hair of your son will fall to the ground. Then the woman said, please, may your servant speak a word to my lord the king. Speak, he replied. The woman asked, why have you devised something similar against the people of God? When the king spoke as he did about this matter, he has pronounced his own guilt. 
the king has not brought back his own banished son, we will certainly die and be like water poured out on the ground, which cannot, which can't be recovered. But God would not take away life. He would devise plans so that the one banished from him does not remain banished. Now, therefore, I've come to present this matter to my Lord, the king, because the people have made me afraid. Your servant thought, I must speak to the king. Perhaps the king will grant his servant's request. The king will surely keep his servant from the grasp of this man who would eliminate both me and my son from God's inheritance. Your servant thought, may the word of my lord, the king, bring relief. For my lord, the king, is able to discern the good and the bad like an angel of God. May the Lord, your God, be with you. Then the king answered the woman, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you something. Don't conceal it from me. Let the Lord, the king, speak, the woman replied. The king asked, did Joab put you up to all this? The woman answered, as you live, my lord, the king, no one can turn to the right or to the left from all my lord, the king says. Yes, your servant Joab is the one who gave orders to me. He told your servant exactly what to say. Joab, your servant, has done this to address the issue indirectly. But my Lord has wisdom, like the wisdom of the angel of God, knowing everything on earth. And the king said to Joab, I hereby grant this request. Go, bra- go back and go, go bring back the young man Absalom. Joab fell with his face to the ground in homage and blessed the king. Today, Joab said, your servant knows I have found favor with you, my lord the king, because the king has granted the request of your servant. So Joab got up, went to Geshur, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. However, the king added, he may return to his house, but he may not see my face. So Absalom returned to his house, but he did not see the king. No man in all Israel was as handsome as, and highly praised as Absalom. From the sole of his feet to the top of his head, he did not have a single flaw. When he shaved his head, he shaved it at the end of every year because his hair got so heavy for him that, his, that he had to shave it off. He would weigh the hair from his head and it would be five pounds according to the royal standard. Three sons were born to Absalom and a daughter named Tamar, who was a beautiful woman. Absalom resided in Jerusalem two years, but never saw the king. Then Absalom sent for Joab in order to send him to the king, but Joab was unwilling to come to him. So he sent, so he sent again a second time, but he still would not come. Then Absalom said to his servants, see, see, Joab has a field right next to the mine, and he has barley there. Go and set fire to it. So Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab came to Absalom's house and demanded, Why did your servants set my field on fire? Look, Absalom explained to Joab, I sent for you and you said, come here. I sent for you and, and said, come here. I want, I want to send you to the king to ask, Why have I come back from Geshur? I'd be better off if I were still there. So now let me see the king. If I'm guilty, let him kill me. So Joab went to the king and told him, uh, and, and so Joab went to the king and told him. So David summoned Absalom, who came to the king and paid homage with his face to the ground before him. Then the king kissed Absalom. Now in this, in the first three verses here, it tells us that there was, it was evident to all that David sorely missed that is ex- he sorely missed his exiled son but no one knew how to achieve Absalom's return and reconciliation well as i mentioned in my introduction Joab knew his king very well and easily recognized how much the king's mind was on his son 
Absalom. He was able to read him pretty well. He knew his leader, you know, and, and again, that was important. You just don't ignore what's going on with your leader. You understand and you want to help. See, Joab knew that he loved his son, but as the commander of the army, his main priority was to protect and to defend the nation of Israel. So he was probably concerned, deeply concerned, that if David suddenly died, if something happened to David, the legitimate heir to the throne wouldn't be readily available to come and step in and start you know, ruling right away. There, he understood there can't be a vacuum. There can't be nothing there. Yeah, he had other sons, but they weren't going to be seen as a legitimate heir. Something had to be done. Something had to be solved about this problem. And you know, as we read, the people knew Absalom, and they liked him. He was a popular guy. And if he wasn't around, if he wasn't there to step in, it would just be chaos, disorder. And so, again, Joab was in charge of making sure that there wasn't any internal conflicts, issues, civil wars, and that he was also there to defend the country from outside forces. But as the heir... Absalom couldn't come home unless David gave permission. And the king wouldn't give permission until he believed it was the right thing to do. He was confused. He wasn't sure. He was off balance. His mind was just like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? I want to do the right thing, but I can't. And, and even if I did, and I love my son. It was, he just was a mess. See, as king, David knew that his son was guilty of plotting and murdering his brother. Today's terms, that would be known as first-degree murder. But as a father, he couldn't order the death penalty on his own son. Well... Finally, Joab, the tactician, always, you know, knowing how to maneuver things and maneuver, maneuver things, um, convinced or even commanded, possibly commanded a wise woman from Tekoa to disguise herself as a mourner and to go to the king. She was to tell him a story of, that she had made, that he had made up. And then told her exactly what to say to him afterwards. So after having gained access to the king, the woman related to him that she had two sons, one of whom, one of whom had murdered the other. This meant that the surviving son was liable to blood vengeance at the hands of the relatives. Well, since she was a widow... This meant that it would be the end of her only source of support. She was a widow. She didn't have her husband to support her. One son was dead, and if they killed the other, she would be broke, possibly homeless. She wouldn't have anything at all. The, her family would now take everything that had belonged to her husband. Nothing would be hers anymore. Now, that's what she meant when she said they would extinguish my one remaining ember. Perhaps even more important, she would have no heir to carry on the name and memory of her dead husband. Now, obviously, upon hearing this story and touched by it, David told the woman to return home in peace and 
he would issue an order that would resolve the matter. But unconvinced that she had made her point, she pressed the case even further. In the event of any miscarriage of justice, she said, she and her family would bear the responsibility. That is, if the circumstances really did require vengeance, as outlined in Numbers chapter 35, verses 9 through 21. She wanted the king to know that he, would, that he wouldn't legally or morally, uh, he wouldn't be morally or legally culpable if he didn't stop it from being carried out. Carried out. Patiently, David heard her out and again assured her that if anyone tried to persecute, prosecute the case, they would have to answer the king. But nevertheless, she relentlessly continued until she was given a formal oath. As the Lord lives, David said, not a hair of your son will fall to the ground. You see, now at this point, taking an oath in the Lord's name was binding, and it couldn't be ignored, especially if it came from the king. Well, satisfied at last, verses 12 to 14 then inform us that the woman boldly accosted the king with the meaning of her parable. In granting amnesty to an unknown murderer, murderer, it was now incumbent on him that he do the same for his own son, Absalom. See, there are circumstances, she said, under which the death penalty need not be applied, need not be applied, particularly where premeditation was not involved. And again, you can see that in Numbers chapter 35, verse 15. Now, even though that really wasn't relevant here, as Absalom had plotted Amnon's death long in advance, this was, again, irrelevant because of that, but there was still a principle of mercy here. She put it like this, but God would not take away a life. He would not devise plans so that the one banished from him does not remain banished. Now, listen and read that verse again carefully because there's something again beautiful there. See, in other words, God, abs God absolutely punishes sin. There's no doubt about it. But he also seeks for ways to reconcile sinners to himself. This here, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the best examples of the gospel in the Old Testament. See, even then, God had devised a way to bring the banished people back to him that they might not be banished from him. The way even today now, at this very moment, that is absolutely possible. And that way is through the person and work of Jesus. And how he stood in the place of guilty sinners as he hung on the cross and received the punishment that we deserved. The punishment for our sins, the punishment for our disobedience the punishment that we had incurred on ourselves. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, that God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, church, ladies and gentlemen, no matter how bad you think you've blown it, no matter how big of a sin you think you have committed, know this, believe this, 
And don't let anyone or anything take this truth away from you. God will forgive you and will accept you as a son and daughter. All you have to do is just come to his son and ask for forgiveness. And he is a God of mercy. He is a God of compassion. And Jesus knows. He understands you. He gets it. He lived as a human. He lived like us. He knew the pain. He knew the temptations. He knew the difficulties. Yes, he gets you. So don't let anyone tell you that your sin is too big to be forgiven. It's a lie from the devil. If any pastor, any church tells you that you, your sin is way too big, no, it's not. He can, God can forgive a simple little white lie as much as he can forgive murder. He's a forgiving God. Always remember that. And he will accept you as a son and daughter. Well, the woman then refused, uh, then returned actually to her fake storyline and began now to flatter David by calling him an angel of God and being able to discern between the good and the bad. But David, he was wise, he's intelligent, he, he knows things, he's not dumber than a box of rocks. So at this point now, he gets the feeling that something was off. Something isn't right. And that someone was probably behind this entire exchange. So the king then said to her, I'm going to ask you something. Don't conceal it. Don't hide it from me. Just tell me the truth. And then asked her, did Joab put you up for this? Put you up to all this? Oh, now she was in the hot box. And sure enough, she spilt the beans. She couldn't uh, lie to the king. So yeah, she told him the truth. She told him that it was Joab who had planned everything, but added that he had good intentions by addressing the issue indirectly, the issue that was at hand. Now, again, we, Jacob, I mean, Joab took the initiative, but I think it seems here that he went about it the wrong way. Um, he could have done, done differently, done things differently, but none, nevertheless, it accomplished its purpose. Well, now, David had no other choice but to act on the words that he expressed to that woman concerning forgiveness, even though that entire story was all made up. He then sent Joab to bring back the alienated, his alienated son back. But when Absalom returned, David had made the decision or had set the condition that he would not be allowed to come to the palace or to see the king. The story then, we see that the story then pauses to point out some pretty remarkable physical features about Absalom that it appears that there were contributing factors. They had, it was inserted here to let you know why he was so popular, why he was well-liked, why the people admired him. There wasn't a single flaw. Now imagine having hair that's five pounds, that weighs five pounds at the end of each year. I had a sister that had dreadlocks and pretty remarkable. I was, you know, always liked their braid. I loved looking at them, but it went, they used to all the way go down to her feet. But she had to 
cut them off. And she had them for a good, what, 10, 15, 20 years maybe. Um, but she had to cut it off in her late 40s because it was affecting her neck. It was so heavy that she was having some serious neck issues. No matter how she would wrap it up or put it, you know, it just was heavy. And obviously it's hard to sleep and, you know, she had some serious neck issues. So, yeah, she had to cut them all off. Her hair now is is natural and it's beautiful. And, you know, I, I once I saw that again, I was like, hey, sister, you look like, you know, like you used to when we were kids. But, uh, but yeah, no, again, just imagine just how heavy that hair was, five pounds. Also, verse 27 testifies of how much he loved and cared for his sister who had been violated by the man that he murdered and who was the reason for this entire predicament that he was in. It says there that he had a daughter named Tamar who was a beautiful woman. So, well, this chapter then ends by saying that after two more years of estrangement, of not seeing his father, Absalom twice sought Joab's aid about bringing a final solution, a resolution to their differences. But every single, in those two times, Joab just pretty much ignored him. He rebuffed him each time. And so Absalom had to resort to some dramatic action in order to get his attention. He set Joab's barley field on fire, which did get the general's attention. Now, it's hard to think here. It's hard to think of a greater contrast than that between Absalom and the prodigal son of Jesus' parable. In that story of the prodigal son, that son came back humble and repentant. But what do we see with Absalom? He came back burning at Joab's fields. Spurgeon also made this observation. He said, at the, time, at the same time, sometimes God gets our attention by setting our barley field on fire. He, knowing that we will not come by any other means, sendeth a serious trial. He sets our barley field on fire, which he has a right to do, seeing our barley fields are far more his than ours. Joab then intervened with the king and at last made it possible for Absalom to be reunited with his father. During that reunion, though, we're told that it ends with the king, that the king kissed Absalom. There is no attempt to bridge the gulf between father and son. Each of them sees the guilt of the other and is cold and, is, and it's unforgiving. But at least a small step had been taken towards reconciliation when Absalom came to the king and paid homage with his face to the ground before him. He gave him the respect that he deserved. The question is, Will he, in the future, remain loyal to the king? Uh, the king has kissed his long-lost son, but not a single word was said. What does that tell us? Well, again, in comparing the story with the story of the prodigal son, the son came back crying and asking for forgiveness, even saying, I work as a servant. And then the son, the father, just in tears, you know, telling his servants, you know, bring the signet, bring the ring, and, you know, let's throw a party, you know, cook up the, the, the most fattest cow or uh, cattle there is. We're going to throw a big carne asada over here. You know, we're going to throw a big party. 
this isn't this, this isn't the scene here. This isn't the case between fa- the father and son here. This also tells us that when you compare this to another similar story found in Genesis chapter 45, it shows us that something was indeed missing. See, in that story in Genesis, when Joseph revealed himself to his brothers, there was much weeping. And in ex- they just exchanged, all, they just were talking, exchanging news and stories and everything that had happened. And there was much joy and celebration with just, again, tears. And there was that was a reunion. Also, Joseph had prepared himself for that meeting by facing up to his own experience of God's goodness which enabled him to genuinely genuinely offer his brothers for forgiveness. Now, in the case of Absalom and the king, there's no any indication of that. There's nothing there. It actually appears that the relationship remained virtually deadlocked, neither side having the spiritual incentive to break it. Sadly, as the, as the subsequent events, as subsequent events demonstrated, David's long delayed acceptance of his son came too late. Chapter 15 will show us when we get there next week that Absalom became embittered and resolved to do whatever was necessary to make his father the king, his, his father and king pay for his unwillingness to budge, to pay for not being the father that he wanted him to be. David, however, as we'll see in that chapter, will find himself losing his throne and his crown. His concubines, one of his trusted advisors, and then ultimately his son, Absalom. Now, as I now begin to close, I'm going to share again some lessons that are found here. Lesson number one, we see, and this is what we see with Joab, is that he took the initiative. Now, I want to point out three kinds of, three different types, three different kinds of initiative. Now, there's a general type of initiative. See, well, let me just mention this first. We live in a culture that would rather ignore or talk about a problem than to step in and to take the initiative to resolve a problem that they see or are aware of. Oh, it's just, it's too big. It's too much. Let someone else handle it. You know, I'm minding my own business. You know, I'm just going to do my thing. And yet... The more it's ignored, the more it's not handled or dealt with, the bigger the problem becomes, and the more eventually it's going to catch up to you, to you, and it's going to affect you. And um, you know, and it could be a number of things. Anything from, again, a, a nail on the ground, on the road, or you know, or just ignoring, not paying attention to the events happening around the world, not praying about it, not making a sound decision about who you're voting for when it comes to your local leaders and your national leaders. Ignoring the issues. Saying, you know what, it's, I don't care. There are many things you can do to take the initiative. And if you see it, take it. Step up. Lead. Lead. Do something. There's a hidden gem that in the final verse of James chapter 4, verse 17, that is often overlooked, not paid attention to much, but there it says, it is a sin to know the good and yet not do it. If you know that something needs to be done and it's a good thing and you just completely Step over it. Ignore it. It's a sin if you don't do it. 
You know, there's certain things that, yeah, again, you you can't involve yourself with. It's a problem beyond your scope, beyond your skill, you know, and, and others have to take care of it. But if it's within your power, within your control, within your ability, take the initiative and do something about it. Also now, the second point I want to make here about this taking the initiative is in ministry. You see, in every church, there's going to be a need, no matter how big or how small. Now, specifically, I mean, if you know our church, there's, whether you know it or not, whether you see it or not, there are a lot of needs. There's a lot of things that maybe are in your mind that you would like to see happening in this church that maybe hasn't even occurred to me, to Isaac, to Robin. You know, it just hasn't, you know, hasn't occurred to us, but you see something that needs to be taken care of or that could happen or that, you know, well, let us know. Tell us. You know, and maybe we'll help you to initiate it, to get it done. But again, that's going to take some initiative from you to step up and not be afraid. This is, ladies and gentlemen, this is your church. This is our church. you are all been gifted by God with an, a special gift in order to build the body up, help each other out. So use that gift for the benefit of all of us. Church needs you. And he has you. God has you there for a reason and purpose. Do you know what the person across from you, sitting next to you, do you know what they need prayer about? What they, you know, need help with? Minister to them. That's one way. Just ask them and, and be loving. Just asking them, hey, you know, is there anything I can pray for you this week about? You know, and those that are being asked, if you're being asked that, don't be shy, don't be embarrassed, don't be uh, freely let someone know about some maybe struggle that you're dealing with. They may understand you and get you. So share it so they can pray for you. These are your brothers and sisters. The Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 said this, just as each one of you has received a gift, use it to serve others as good stewards of the very grace of God. And I already touched on a lot of what that means. Now the third part of this is taking the initiative in someone else's life. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not saying to get involved in someone's life and and, and step in and control or, you know, take over their lives and, and tell them what to do and, and how to live it. No, I'm not talking about that. See, we live in a culture today where people would rather pick up their phones and press record and to put their phones down and help that person that is suffering, that is in need. I've seen videos of, on YouTube of police officers fighting with criminals out in the street, and no one is helping, no one is attempting to help that police officer out. And he's struggling and fighting and struggling, and, and everyone's just recording. People are passing by and walking by, and it just blows my mind away that this is happening and no one's doing anything about it. I, I, I imagine, it makes me imagine if, if I was drowning in the middle of Elephant Butte, if anyone would help me or whether they just be recording the event just to go viral, just to be, you know, have that million likes and views on YouTube, that is more you know, beneficial to them than to help somebody out. It's sad. It's sad, the kind of state of affair or the mindset that people have nowadays. And again, it's because of selfishness, because of pride, because of, you know, what's in it for me. 
very sad, but there are ways you can help others. You can lend a helping hand without necessarily getting fully involved in their lives. And seeming like you're now over, like being an overbearing um, father or mother or, or just a person in their lives. One of the best things you can do, whether it's a coworker, whether it's someone here, whether it's someone in your neighborhood, it's just see someone suffering, someone having a hard time, regardless again of what their lifestyle is, regardless of what their religion is, what, regardless of what their, you know, what's happening, the kind of life they're living, it's just to listen. Say, hey, what's going on? Want to talk about it? Just listen. A lot of times all they want you to do is just to hear them out. And if they, and whether it's re requested or not, and this is important here, see if you ah, offer that advice. Can I help you? You know, yeah, no, well, they may say, no, no, thanks, I'm good. But at least you're offering it. Don't assume that they're not going to accept it or that they, you know, they shouldn't, that you don't want to impose. Ask. That's the Christian way. That is the loving way is to, to, to love your neighbor by offering to help during a difficult time. When they express to you and share with you about some serious thing, problems they're dealing with. Even if it's just, hey, you know what? Let me buy you a meal. Don't worry about cooking dinner tonight. Let me bring you some dinner tonight. Let's go out for a walk. Now, again, that's part, that's just one part of it. The next part of it is the Lord may use an opportunity like that to open a door to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those, that's what I call divine appointments. Where all of a sudden, you know, I, I just, we're talking about something and and this is now, the Lord is opening now the door for me to share about Jesus Christ. And sharing the gospel, the gospel that saves, that solves solution, that saves lives, that frees those that are bound by the chains of addiction. The Lord will do that. Jesus commanded his followers, Christians, us. If you call yourself a Christian, if you call, then you're a follower of Christ. And he, this is what he commanded in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. All right. I'll quickly move on here. The second lesson is we see here is heeding advice, heeding advice and wisdom. You know, and this is a lesson from the woman from Tekoa. Now, we all know that advice comes in many shapes, forms, and can come from many places. It can come from here in the pulpit. It can come from a book. It can come from listening to a podcast. It can come from a number of, of ways. From even a small child. You can get a lot of wisdom from a child but that ability now. There's one thing to, to hear that advice, but to apply it, to apply that advice, that's actual wisdom. It says in Proverbs, well, the Bible is, Proverbs is, is full of verse, verses and uh, where it talks about fools. But here in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 14, it says, without guidance, a people will fall. But with many counselors, there is deliverance. And later in chapter 12, verse 15, we're told, a fool's way is right in his own eyes, but whoever listens to counsel is wise. Seek that advice. Seek that help. Don't be shy. Don't be embarrassed to seek it. And when you get it, whether you like what it's being, what's being told, apply it. It's gonna, it may hurt. It may sting. 
may not be easy to hear or do, but you'll see how much wisdom there is in, how much wisdom you have by applying it. And then how you'll be able to now share that experience with others who maybe now experienced something similar. All right, lesson three, the, and here's where I begin to close here, the importance of forgiveness and reconciliation. If you look carefully again at the last sentence of verse 33, you will see that David's kiss was the official sign of reconciliation and restoration. You're good. I'm good. Welcome back. But the thing is that it was given reluctantly. I'm not really sure that I really want to do this after all that you did, after murdering your half-brother. The fact that David, his father, didn't give, him, didn't give it to him instantly, didn't give him instant and whole, wholehearted forgiveness, really messed Absalom up inside. If you look back, when David sinned, that wasn't the kind of forgiveness God gave him. God didn't say, well, I forgive you, but we're not going to have fellowship anymore. I won't restore you to the joy of your salvation. He didn't say that. He didn't say that at all to David. See, when God forgives, he forgives completely. We're told in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. So has God forgiven you? Absolutely. So then, knowing that, how are you to forgive others? Well, the answer should be obvious, the same way God does. Someone wronged you, has seriously disappointed you, has really seriously hurt you. If you're a Christian, know this. Forgive them. Forgive them for whatever harm, whatever they did to you. It's, it's hard, I know. There's people in my life that is, it's hard for me to forgive. But I have to. I've been called to. And as Christians, if you're a born-again Christian, you're called to do the same thing. I forgave my abuser. I forgave him. It took me many years. But I had to. In order to find that peace that I needed. I understood all the, when I saw all the things and, that I had done to offend God and all the things that I had done in my own life, all the sins, the ugliness, it was nothing what that person did in my life at a young age, at a very young age, was pales in comparison to what I did. I was, the, I was essentially the one putting the nails in Jesus' hands and feet, I was mocking him. I was laughing at him. I was spitting at his face. I was, you know, that was me. So he forgave me. Who am I now to not forgive the person who hurt me the most in my most vulnerable stage of my life? I hope that one day I'll be able to share those words to him. But if not, the Lord knows my heart. And I, I share this with you because, again, there may be some of you watching, some of you here that have dealt with some serious, some similar issues, some serious hurt, and you haven't found that place. 
and because of that it still brings you a lot of anguish a lot of uh, so tr certain things so trigger you so hurt you again I, I'm not saying get over it I'm not I'm not saying that at all but one step to healing an important step to healing is by forgiving that person and even it may even mean forgiving yourself church let me once again remind you that our God is a God who forgives now it also says in Galatians 6 1 brothers and sisters if someone is overtaken in any wrongdoing you who are spiritual restore such a person with a gentle spirit watching out for yourselves that you also won't be tempted Unfortunately, I've seen many Christians read this verse incorrectly and think that it means if anyone does you wrong, hit them back twice as hard. Why? Because when we're hurt, we're reluctant, we're reluctant to forgive. We can be very mean, unloving, and very critical. Friends, there are times when the truth should be spoken. But when forgiveness is asked for, when you're being asked for forgiveness, it should be extended immediately. Don't sit there and tell me, let me think about it. Did Jesus ever say that to you? You think God would ever say that to you and asking him, you know, I... I hope that Jesus is as real to you as he is to me. And I, I really, again, I'm not questioning that, you know, but I'm just saying that if he is, then that there should be no hesitation when you're being asked for forgiveness. Listen carefully. It's the words of Jesus in Luke 17, verses, Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, Forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and comes back to you seven times saying, I repent, you must forgive him. In other words, there is no end to forgiveness. Now, this is the part of my message where I now tell those that haven't heard the gospel message, that the gospel is for you. God is in heaven right now seeking to, for that reconciliation. To, he wants that fellowship, that relationship to be restored that was broken because of sin, because of your sin. And he's seeking that. And the only way that can happen is through Jesus Christ. So if you're ready receive that, to have that reconciliation, to be restored back into fellowship with God, to be forgiven of all your sins. And I want to lead you in a prayer to do that, wherever you may be. So if that's you, I want you to close your eyes and bow your head and with all sincerity, with a pure heart, pray this. Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead. I now turn from my sins and confess you as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for saving me. Now fill me with the Holy Spirit so that he may help guide me in my new born-again life. In your name, amen. If you sincerely prayed that, you're now a child of God. You're now a son and daughter of God. There's no doubt about it. So we want to help lead you in your next steps of your Christian walk. And So give us a call. Let us know you prayed that. You want to hear your story. But, you know, again, know this. God has so much more in store for you. It's not going to be an easy walk, but it's, you know, he's going to be with you the entire way. Thank you for watching. Have a great day. Be blessed. We love you.